Hey, welcome to The Perspective Today. Mike Sherbino here. And oftentimes when we begin a program, we're talking about a need or a crisis or how you can press through a challenging situation. My goodness, it could be as basic and yet as important as going back to high school or college. Maybe you're starting a new job for the first time. Maybe you're entering a relationship. Perhaps you're navigating a financial crisis. Or maybe you've made a terrible mistake in the last few weeks and you're wondering, can I ever recover? And then we come to global matters and we wonder what on earth is going on, whether it's Canadian politics or whether it's U.S. politics or international. In a moment, we're going to be talking about what actually is taking place in Israel and how do we sort that out? Is that even possible? But what I want to let you know today, and I'm so excited to talk to you about this, is a new booklet that we're producing here at The Perspective every month. It's a daily devotional that takes you through portions of the Old Testament and the New Testament. You can read it in about 10 minutes time each day, or you can spend longer reflecting on the passages. And as you go in and look at the book, it will help you navigate life. It will give you strength for each day. It's available to you free of charge if you write to us at The Perspective. We need your mailing address and we'll mail it out to you. This is September's edition, but October will soon be here as well. And we'll send that out to you each month. And what I do is with the Bible teaching, I link it in to the reading for each day. So even if you miss one of the shows, you'll know what I've been talking about. So I hope you'll enjoy that. I hope you'll write to me. You can write prayer at the perspective.tv and just request the devotional book will need your address. Today on The Perspective, I'm excited to welcome back uh, Jonathan Feldstein. He is the president of Genesis 123. I think this is his fourth or fifth time to be on the program. And as I said to him a few minutes ago, when I watch the news and I see what is happening in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv in the Middle East, my first thought is, I wonder how Jonathan is doing. So we're going to ask him right now. And Jonathan, I want to thank you for coming back on the program. Appreciate it because I know it's been a difficult for you even to hook up today as you've been traveling. Yes, indeed. I'm, I'm speaking to you from a gate in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth Airport, but it really is always a pleasure and, and to go out of my way to be here, to be able to speak with you. Thank you for, for having me again. I know you'll do it so succinctly and clearly, but explain to us your connection with the States because you've lived there, but also tell the people where home is now and your family's involvement and what literally is taking place in the uh, conflict in the Middle East. Right. So I was born in New York almost 60 years ago. So I'm an American citizen, but I was also and and grew up here, raised here, um, went to college in the U.S., began my career, and five of my six children were born here in America. Um, it's funny to say here, speaking to you, because usually I'm doing it from the other side, but 20 years ago, uh, exactly 20 years ago, my family and I picked up and fulfilled a, a, a biblical promise, receiving the opportunity to become citizens of the, the state of Israel. My father was born there. I think I've shared that with you. Of course, yeah. when he was born, there was not a state of Israel yet. So he was what I refer to as an original Palestinian. He was born in 1937 when the British controlled what was then called an administrative area, not a state called Palestine. And when the British referred to only the Jewish people as Palestinian, um, but it was time for me to go back. My wife and I had wanted to do that each in parallel since we were teenagers. And um, now with my youngest son, uh, having been inducted in the army just two weeks ago, um, you know, it's not that we, we certainly are living through our share of challenges, especially now and, and over the last two decades, but I have to say the blessings far outweigh all of the challenges. As you talk about things so succinctly, you think, okay, everything is just like a cookie cutter, but it's not. Uh, we read the news, and here as a Canadian, and I think uh, also as Americans, we have a slanted perspective because of how we're being fed the news. And as I just shared with you recently, uh, what prior to just taping this program, I'm looking at the news feed on my phone and as I look at it, it talks about, oh, Israel killed another so many, so many Palestinians. And it leaves you with the sense that they are the bad guys. 
help me to understand, help us to understand what I want to call negative rhetoric. Well, it's appropriate that your it's appropriate that your show is called the perspective because what's necessary in understanding Israel and the modern Middle East is perspective. Uh, back in the 1980s, I worked for the Israeli Foreign Ministry in Atlanta, and one day I happened to be the driver for the uh, Consul General of New York, who, or maybe he was, yeah, the Consul General uh, to the, or was it, I, I don't know what his position was, but a major uh, diplomat who you've heard of, his name is Benjamin Netanyahu, he flew to Atlanta for a day for one meeting to meet with CBN, uh, CNN producers uh, to explain the perspective, to explain the context. And it's very hard uh, on, on the headlines that you're reading from Canada or in the U.S. or anywhere in the world to um, boil down what's happening in a few words or a sentence um, with integrity, assuming that integrity is even in the picture. And, uh, and that's why conversations like this are important to unpack and understand uh, what in fact is going on and, and, and what's happening in Israel and that when headlines and news articles have bias, and again, I, I let's not even assume that it's a bias that's um, malicious, there, well, there's plenty of that. Um, bias can just be from ignorance, and we need to uh, unpack that and, and correct it. So I'm glad to have that conversation with you about the perspective. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to uh, invite you to go a little deeper with this in the first part of this interview, because we, you know, we're going to have a second part of the interview in just a moment, but unpack to us uh, your perspective as an Orthodox Jewish person, uh, what is the agenda of Hamas? And suddenly now we're hearing this other word, Hezbollah. Explain yeah. it to us. Pretend I'm in grade three. And are they working together? Are they working apart? How do we understand and perceive the tensions that are there, even with the U.S. administration trying to negotiate a peace deal? Okay, well, we'll come back to the administration and peace or ceasefire. Um, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, other organizations that are now in the, in the news, the Houthis in, in, in uh, Yemen, are all Islamic terror organizations. They more or less all have grown out of what's known as the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, which was founded in Egypt uh, almost 100 years ago, in, if I'm not mistaken, in 1929, and is illegal. Uh, it, it, no, important to note, in Egypt today. It's that radical organization that even in Egypt, it's an illegal organization, and it comes. And their charter essentially calls for the wasn't state of Israel then, but the charter of Hamas, the charter of okay. Hezbollah, are genocidal, anti-Semitic organizations, Islamic extremists. They they don't want Jews in the land. They believe that um, once there has ever been Islam put in any land, I don't mean only uh, Israel, and, and it specifically as the by the Holy Land, the land that God deeded to the Jewish people. But this includes Spain, where the Islamic conquest uh, extended centuries ago. Once they controlled it once, it's always part of a global caliphate. And so we, are the, we, the Jewish people in the state of Israel, are the easy fruit or the low-hanging fruit, the, the small state, and, um, which also is important to note that all of these organizations come from, the, if you will, their spiritual grandfather, the head of the octopus in Iran, the Islamic regime, it's important to know, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, I was with a major um, uh, Iranian Christian leader here in the Dallas area, and we were talking again what I know about the Iranian people who love Israel and the Jewish people, but um, have been indoctrinated for now four and a half decades by their Islamic regime. All of it's coming down to that, and a conversation that you and I had had before um, beginning the recording goes to the question as to whether or not you can never have peace with these organizations. And the bottom line is, no, they don't want peace. Peace means a complete destruction of the state of Israel and annihilation of the Jewish people. And then they come for the Christians because uh, we are protected minorities as people of the book, but we are also both uh, Jews and Christians considered infidels. That's a really kind of a, a harsh reality when we think about it. We don't ever hear that in the news that the ultimate goal of these groups, these uh, terrorist organizations, is the destruction, ultimate destruction of the the nation of Israel, uh, the Jewish people, and then uh, Christians themselves. Uh, why do we soft sell that? 
Um, because first of all, being Western, it's hard to actually believe that people think that and, and, uh, or get, getting a little political, you, you can't avoid, uh, Kamala Harris's recent acceptance speech where she talks about, um, protecting, uh, uh protecting the world from, uh, anti-Islam, uh, Islamic feelings, because God yeah. forbid anyone should be politically incorrect by stating the truth. Um, the truth, but the truth is the truth. And, and I'm not disparaging all of Islam. I don't know enough to do that. Um, but I can tell you Islamic extremism doesn't tolerate you or me. Um, but I, again, I'm the low hanging fruit. I live in the land, um, uh, we're, we're, uh, less than a kilometer from the nearest Palestinian Arab village out my front window and, uh, 40 miles to the Gaza border on the other end of Israel. So, um, we, we're, we're the, we're the easy one and sadly historically even post holocaust um most of the world doesn't really care when jews are killed by arabs as you indicated reading the headlines um of your of your news today is the news is when jews and israelis kill our kill arabs not vice versa but i just have to interject it was just a few days ago um that israel rescued an, another one of the hostages alive thank god who was a bedouin israeli Muslim Arab, right? That, that that's not a narrative. The, first of all, the, the amazing heroic rescue mission, putting Israeli troops, Jewish troops, in harm's way to rescue an Arab citizen because he's an Arab citizen. Because we honor that. Because everyone counts in Israel. But the fact that for over three hundred and twenty days, uh, Hamas also not just kidnapped this man and held him in tunnels, but they shot him at the beginning and they pulled the bullet out without any anesthesia. Um, because they just considered him an Israeli. Wow. Hey, you're watching The Perspective today. Jonathan Feldstein is with me. We're going to continue to unpack the uh, reality of what is taking place in the Middle East and also how it's in, uh, been interpreted here in Canada and the States. So stay with me. We're going to be back in just a moment. Hey, you're watching The Perspective today. And if at any time you want to reach out and talk to somebody, we have a toll-free number at 855-910-6297. And helping me again today to understand the complexities of the Middle East is Jonathan Feldstein. Jonathan, you're the president of Genesis 123 Foundation. What is that all about? We are a U.S.-based nonprofit that builds bridges between Jews and Christians and Christians with Israel in ways that are new, unique, and meaningful. So what that ultimately means is I'm trying to find all kinds of unique ways to connect us, Jews and Christians, to build on those critical, important pillars that we that we share um, as Jews and Christians, we're the only people who worship the, um, the Creator, the God of Israel, and uh, finding meaningful ways to do that, to, that are relational, not simply transactional. And uh, I appreciate such a, an ambitious uh, agenda that you have. That is huge. And that's part of the reason I have you on the program. I just want to, I hope I'm encouraging you in a small way because you are encouraging us immensely and your perspective is so appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. You have a beautiful book that people can have. Normally I have it with me, but it's at my home today. It's a coffee table book. Tell people about that because it narrates the 75th anniversary of the nation of Israel. Yes, this was a vision that God gave me almost two years ago. 
uh, in, in six months in advance of celebrating Israel's 75th anniversary. And long before we knew we were going to be in the midst of a war, but it's uh, called Israel the Miracle. Anyone can find it at israelthemiracle.com. And what it is is a compilation of 75 essays by Christian leaders of all backgrounds, ethnically, uh, denominationally, demographically, re regionally, from all over the world, writing about why Israel is so significant. And the essays are all very good to powerful, make you cry because of how uh, theologically significant they are and who some of the authors are. Um, we have, we, we pulled him out of uh, uh, alphabetical order and put Pat Robertson's essay first, because just as we were preparing to go to press a little over, um, a little over a year ago, um, Pat Robertson died. So in honor of him and who he was, we put his essay first and you could stop reading the book just with that. But it's very powerful yeah. uh, book. And as many okay. people have said, since the war, it came out just two weeks before the war began. And since the war did begin, there are many elements of it that are indeed prophetic. So I certainly invite people to check it out at israelthemiracle.com. And, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the publisher. I, I had the vision, but I ultimately give the give the credit to God, not just for giving me the idea, but for enabling me to pull this off in nine months, which is a, a miracle in and of itself. It really is. And I just want to vouch that it's just a fantastic book. Uh, we want to talk about two things right now in the final five minutes that we have together. Uh, is peace possible, and I believe it is because um, I believe in the power of God to change things, but from a human perspective, are people thinking there's going to be a peace accord or are they expecting things to get worse? I think that most Israelis think that things will, at, at best, we will have a pause or what people are referring to as a ceasefire, but that's not a, that's not peace. Um, that would no. be a cessation of hostilities. It would allow Hamas to regroup in Gaza, it certainly would allow Hezbollah to um, maintain the, you know, if it's estimated they they fired somewhere between about 10,000 rockets and drones at Israel since October, um, that still leaves them with 140 as the low, 140,000 as the low estimate. So that's surely not peace. Wow. It leaves us um, in, a, in a strange position that's militarily no less threatening than what we are today. But as far as peace, I do believe that. And you and I have had this conversation. The only way for peace, however, it's not a geopolitical thing. It's not another UN resolution. It's not bringing in UN peacekeepers, which have sailed just on every border possible, uh, uh, enabling the terrorists to um, hijack the countries in which they uh, exist. The peace is, as you alluded to, it's a change of heart. Um, that's what we've built up. And it's very bold uh, in, in our um, plan. In fact, I was just working on that meetings here in Dallas before uh, coming on with you. It's called uh, it's called solutionforpeaceingaza.com. And what we're calling for is sending 100,000 or 200,000 Christian volunteers to be responsible for rebuilding and rehabilitating Gaza. And through that, really giving Gaza a, a change of perspective. We keep coming back to that word appropriately with you and your program, but also a change of heart. Because uh, even people in the U.S. State Department who are, who are pushing a whole two-state solution uh, concept, which is a failed concept, which can't actually ever take place, um, but believe that that is the golden ring, that that's the uh, thing to strive for, understand that Hamas, Hezbollah, we talked about, Muslim Brotherhood, the Houthis, the, the Iranian regime, are all ideology. And, in, and you can't defeat an ideology unless you have a better ideology. And it will thrill me to have 100,000 or 200,000 Christians come in to Gaza truly to rehabilitate, hey. truly to ex expose that better idea, which is a relationship with the God of Israel. Um, and unfortunately, for good and for bad, I believe that's the only actual solution for peace. It's doable, but it's, no, it's, it's going to take a long time. Hey. Um, it's not an overnight solution. But then again, God is great. God can do anything. So we're putting our faith and and building a plan that's got the foundation in Him. Wow, I love that. I mean, that's a whole show in itself. As we talk about that, uh, as exciting as it sounds, I I got a whole bunch of questions, and we're going to have to hold that for another time. 
We have a minute left in the program today, Jonathan. What is, as as a father and a husband and, and just living outside Jerusalem, what is your biggest concern right now for the safety of where you are? What do you, hopefully, it's not going to happen, but what are you anticipating? Well, honestly, my biggest concern is the what I think is inevitable and actually and actually necessary is a is a swift military defeat of Hezbollah. Um, they pose a tremendous threat to all of Israel and be cutting off at the source of the Islamic regime. I was with the I mentioned with an Iranian Christian leader here the other day who prays for Israel to to attack uh, Iran, finish the nuclear sites but we know what we know what uh comes as a result of that hundreds and thousands of missiles and rockets and drones fired at us and a and a massive um painful consequence that we would have to bear but uh, my comfort in that mike is that it's biblical we, we've had wars before there have been losses ultimately god is on our side and we win i don't want to go through that pain but i recognize that sometimes and in our case now, pain may have to be part of the ultimate victory. Well, Jonathan, I appreciate your candor, your frankness. And as we conclude the program today, our prayer is for uh, peace in the Middle East and the cessation of hostilities, the buildup of anger and hatred that has been ingrained in children, even from birth. Um, yeah, it, it is horrific. Thank you for the part that you're playing in seeking to make a difference. And may you know God's peace and protection in your life, uh, in all thank the work that you're carrying on. Uh, thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, folks, you're watching The Perspective. My name is Mike Sherber. I'm going to be back in just a moment. I want to invite you today to write to us, prayer at the perspective.tv, and request the devotional book. It'll help you to follow along with my daily teaching. Plus, it will help you to grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ to become a follower of Him. This month, we're going through the book of Philippians and the book of Ruth. Plus, there is a longer read that you can have, which takes you through the New Testament in six months. Write to me and we'll send you your copy. And if you're able to help support us with this venture, we would appreciate that so much. So part of the reading for today is to take us to the book of Philippians chapter one, tra rather chapter four, verses one to three, and how appropriate the passage is in light of the conversation we've just had with Jonathan. As we talk about conflict and problems throughout the world, the, the great writer C.K. Chesterton once responded to an essay competition the competition was entitled, What's Wrong with the World? And he responded with two words. And those two words were, I am. I am what's wrong. What he was saying is that he was owning that bitterness and strife starts within us. It's always easy to point the finger at other folks. And if you and I go through life living that way, we're going to see that it's always going to be the other person and not us. We need to own our part and then ask God to do the repair work that's needed. We're going to jump to the Philippians chapter 4, and Paul is going to tell us about two ladies who he deeply loved, who helped him, and yet they were knocking heads with each other. We're not told exactly why they were upset at each other, but let's read the passage verses 1 to 3, and we'll discover more together. He says, therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And I'm entreating, here are the two ladies, Iodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. 
Yes, I ask you also this, true companions, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Incredible people who are walking together, and yet there was conflict. So here's a question. How do you and I measure success? Paul talks about the Philippian spiritual success as his crowning achievement. We hear the powerful words of one who cares deeply for them when he says that he loves and longs for them and wants them to stand firm in their faith. Ever wonder what could cause your faith to be on shaky ground? Well, Satan will use a variety of things to cause you to wander from the Lord. All sorts of temptation, sickness, discouragement, and unanswered questions. But one that often sneaks up on us is unresolved conflict with other Christians. Throughout the scriptures, we're admonished to love one another, to get along with one another. And Jesus himself prayed that the church would be one. And when Jesus prayed for oneness, it was so that the world would believe that Jesus was sent to earth by the Father. Wow, did you get that? Now, the problem with getting along with others is that normally it's all their fault, but never mind. So when they fess up, then we can get along with them. Until then, I'm going to stand my ground. Yikes, folks, are you hearing how that sounds? The church at Philippi had a lot going for it. But these two ladies, Yodia and Syntyche, could not get along. And we're not told why or what was the problem, which is likely best, because then we'd want to compare our personal conflicts with theirs. Instead, what we need to hear is the heart of Paul, who has just said how much he loves them and cares for them and wants them to agree together. I'm intrigued that in his plea for reconciliation, he also notes how these women had labored side by side with him and sharing the gospel. And what we can't minimize is the fact that division breaks the heart of God, divides his church, and causes the world that is looking on to say, thanks, but no thanks. So whether it's the Middle East, or whether it's in your church, or whether it's in your family, own your part to be reconciled to people. And first of all, to be reconciled with God by just opening up your heart and saying, Lord Jesus, I'm asking you, to be my savior, to be my friend. If you're praying that prayer today, write to me at prayer at the perspective.tv. I'll send you a copy of our new booklet for this month, and I'll also send you some other literature that will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. And until tomorrow, I'm Mike Sherbino. We'll see you then.